Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So when when you open when you got your cell phone and opened it for the first time and you wanted to navigate somewhere, so you might have noticed that you had Google Maps and maybe Orange their partner now, but Orange GPS and Glimpse, whatever the heck that is, and all you wanted is Waze, right? Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a problem. What what the reason you have all this stuff? Um, I could say junk. Uh, pre-installed on your device is because in the last few years, device manufacturers and the mobile operators, they don't make any money. I mean, cents, not on the dollar. They, they profit cents on the device. So if you pay like four, $350 for like a brand new LG, whatever, LG is making about 12 cents off of that device. Uh, so the way they make up for that is by pre-bundling applications and pre-installing them on your device. Hold on, we almost got the presentation here. All right. All right. So the way this happens is that six months before you actually get your device, um, they will bundle whatever they want to pre-install uh, for you. Uh, and that's how they make a little bit more money and are able to stay profitable in, in a generation where it's becoming really, really hard to stay profitable. Um, so AppCloud, uh, which is the project that I work for uh, at Iron Source. Full screen. No? OK. We just we won't do full screen. <laughs> So AppCloud, the, problem that the, the project that I work for at IronSource, is trying to solve that problem uh, by allowing users to choose what they want to install when they set up their device for the first time. All right, now everything works. So the benefit to the user is that the user could choose to install when they set up the device what they want. Instead of getting things pre-installed for them, which someone which is going to be out of date because it was burned six months ago, and it's not really what you wanted, you get to choose what you want. Uh, and that's great for the user. It's great for these advertisers who are paying to be bundled on the phones because now the users actually want their software, so suddenly the user value is a lot higher. And that's really good for the, the manufacturers and the, uh, the cell phone companies because uh, they get higher fees from the advertisers because they get the targeted users. And not only that, uh, this actually allows the, uh, the, the, the manufacturer or the mobile network the chance to start developing, developing sorry, a relationship with the user. And that's really good. Uh, and what it looks like is, is what you could see uh, here. When the user starts up the device, they get a screen that looks like this. Uh, we also have another nifty feature that we can actually use uh, real-time events to, to trigger uh, and try to figure out when a new app might be good uh, for a user. So no more searching for apps. Now uh, we, we actually have context-driven uh, apps that when, when it makes sense for you to, to, to possibly want something, we offer it to you. You want it and you install it. You don't, you tell us to go away and we'll go away. Um, so what does this look like behind the scenes? We have several content catalogs uh, and we have something called the app personalization engine. What the app personalization engine it does is it's our runtime server, okay? A request comes in from a device. We try to figure out what kind of device it is. Is it a home geared device? Is it a business geared device? What company is this? Blah, 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 blah. And we take all the content, push it out, and some send a screen to the device that looks something like this. The user selects what they want, clicks next, 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 installs. So enough about AppCloud, because it's a technical presentation. How did we develop this? Um, so the basic system that we have looks something like this. Uh, we have this back-end service, some sort of content management system that's connected to a load balancer. And on the other side of the load balancer, we're assuming we have some sort of uh, content manager who's editing the data. The data gets, stay, uh, gets pushed into a relation, uh, rela relational database. And then we have something called 
Data processing, see if this works. Ah, oh, something works. Data processing. So data processing is a whole bunch of microservices that are running there. We only have two links for, you know, from the database and then to this S3 bucket. But there's a lot happening behind the scenes there. It's, it's uh, talking to Google Play, and it's talking to our business logic, and it's talking to our analytics. Um, and what, what we end up doing, uh, sort of like what Yaniv mentioned earlier, we try to pre-process everything. We want our front ends to be lean and fast. So the, the, pro the data processing takes all the data and pushes everything out to an S3 bucket in a form that's easily ingestible by the front end. Um, and then when a user comes and requests something from the front end, we can push something out really nicely. So it started with development. We added production. When we wanted to do production, we just kind of split the entire thing. We made you know, another set of the back end and another set of the front end. And things look nice. So we had two big uh, design considerations that uh, I want to talk to you about. The first consideration, um, so there's this phrase in Hebrew, uh, which basically means that the more property one has, the more problems uh, one has. Uh, and that was really our problem when we started scaling this out to lots and lots of different customers because things got really, really crazy. And the other thing, the other concern we had, so our customers are big enterprises, and they asked, well, what happens if an attacker breaches one of the servers? So it's all nice and dandy that we're separating everything into like their own little backends and their own little frontends, but they, everything sits inside of public cloud, inside of Amazon in our case. Uh, and if everything's in one big security group, then what happens if, if someone hacks into a server of customer A, um, then they might be able to access the, the database of customer B. And our enterprise customers were specifically worried about a scenario where this might happen because uh, being enterprise customers, they knew that everyone had these different requirements and they said, well, what if someone else adds something that's gonna, that's gonna endanger me? So those are the two concerns that we're gonna wanna focus on. Uh, the answer is partitioning. We need to partition our environments properly. And when we talk about partitioning, we specifically are talking about two types of environments. We're talking about multi-tenant environments. So we started out uh, with the idea that this might be a multi-tenant kind of environment where all the customers you know, come to, to one uh, big service uh, and then it's really easy for us. We could push code, fa we could push changes faster, we could get features out to the, to the customers faster, we could test things more robustly, but enterprise customers, being enterprise customers, don't like that. Enterprise customers like to be VIPs. So we make them VIPs and we give them these single tenant interfaces. Uh, and when, when in any type of partitioning, what we want to focus on is separating the important components. So this brings us down to the, to the big question that I want to answer in this uh, presentation. In a modern cloud where most hardware is multi-tenant by design, by definition, how can we accomplish single-tenant partitioning? And there are three parts to the answer. Uh, we could talk about the, the hardware partitioning, or since we're in a cloud, the virtual hardware partitioning. We have the network partitioning, or again, in the cloud, it's the virtual network partitioning. And we have the application layer, which is whatever we want. You know, we own the application. So for hardware, uh, that could be a talk in and of itself. The, the, the TLDR of that is that we use dedicated compute instances or EC2 instances for people who speak AWS uh, for each component uh, or environment where environment is usually a customer. So networking. When we started to tackle networking, we said, well, let's rewind a few years. How did people used to do this before we moved into the cloud? Uh, and the answer is VLANs. Every customer would get their own VLAN or set of VLANs. And no customer, the customer's VLANs couldn't interact with one another. And if we had shared components that everyone needed access to, then we'd put those on their own shared VLANs. So in AWS, we could just say that a VLAN equals a VPC, loosely speaking. And what it looks like is something like this. Now every single customer sits in its own little VLAN. The customers are now all segregated. Uh, but that's not really good enough. Uh, we want to talk about security groups. So security groups is how is, is really the basic fundamental and before we get to VLANs and uh, in, in non-Amazon a security group is basically a firewall rule. Uh, so if we want to prevent different components from talking to each other, we need these. And 
in, when we used security groups, we needed extensive use of what's called jump rules. Uh, since we're elastic, I mean, in a classic VLAN, in a, in a private cloud or private anything, when you host, when you're setting up your own network, you could just make IP addresses or site arranges, and that would work great. In a cloud, that's not going to work because your addressing is always going to change. So we use these jump rules a lot. Uh, and, and what it looks like is this. We, oh, God. <laughs> Each customer and component pair will have at least one security group, uh, and that helps to kind of separate uh, the different rules of how components talk together and what they're allowed to talk to and what they're not allowed to talk to. Uh, something else to note here is that we, we separated where there was one bucket earlier, we separated it to two buckets. So now we have one read-write bucket that the, uh, that the, the, the data backends, the, the microservices that are part of that data pipeline that I spoke of earlier can write to. Uh, and the front ends can only read from. And there's also different access controls set up. Um, so even beyond the physical security, the, the, the back ends can only get to one of the, to the write copy, and the front ends can only get to the read copy. Each customer component pair, right, so we said this. Uh, in addition to security, separating those S3 buckets gave us something else. It lets us do cross-region deployments. Uh, so now anywhere where there's an S3 bucket, which uh, in Amazon for the last few years is in every one of their data centers, we can now bring up a front-end cluster. Not only that, if we want to bring up clusters outside of Amazon, all we need is uh, S3 compatible storage, which is abundant these days, and we could set up a front-end cluster anywhere. So that's it for the network. Uh, for the application layer, so before I go into the application layer, I want to introduce this slide. Um, to kind of make things easier when, when I'm talking later, we're going we're gonna to take this little set of microservices and talk about them. So we have this service that what happens if in the back end if a, if a publisher wants to publish an app to the database. So the, we're going to start here with the back end. Someone's going to do something. It's going to send a message to the public to the publish app um, microservice. The publish app microservice is going to put something into S3, and it's going to call these two microservices. The names, by the way, don't really matter. Uh, it could be just A, B, and C. It was just easier for me to think in terms of, let's do something useful. So A is going to call B and C. B and C are going to do something with the data, and they're going to give the, the, the data back to A, and A is going to push the, the answer back into the microservice, uh, into the database, sorry. So there's a quote that I'd like to open with. Elastic applications in a public cloud should support zero configuration. Does anyone know who said this? Me. <laughs> zero configuration allows us to support uh, both auto-scaling groups and auto-healing in a lot of instances. So uh, there's a design pattern that's, that's coming out now called disposable architecture. And there's even another one that's, that, that's coming out on top of that called immutable architecture. Uh, and, and it's really basically the same idea. The, the idea is that you, you have the same thing over and over and over. So the, the hardware and the networking it becomes less important. It's just the same thing running somewhere. Uh, and that only becomes possible if the application and the network and the hardware work together to give you uh, zero configuration so that you can actually implement something like this. So zero configuration is, has four basic main components. Uh, networking, service discovery, credentials and identity management, and application and config. So networking is when, when the machine comes up, the machine needs to know where it is on the network. So the public cloud providers all make this really easy for us. They do it for us. When you come up, you get DHCP, you get a private IP address. If you want, you get a public IP address. Life is good. So we have to deal with the other three. Service discovery. Seth made my life so much easier before. Uh, I, don't, I don't even have to explain it anymore now. Everyone knows what service discovery is, right? Uh, for people who miss Seth, it, the idea is that uh, it, when a component comes up, it wants to talk to someone else, some other microservice. How does it know where that other microservice is and how to get to it? Credentials and identity management. So uh, especially in the context of lots of different environments running the same code, when an environment comes up, how does it know who it is? It, how does it know if it's production or staging or development? How does it know if it belongs to customer A or customer B or if it's a demo account? It needs some way of know, getting its identity. Uh, and the last thing is it needs to get the actual runtime, the, the, the bits that need to run, uh, and the configuration for it. So networking we spoke of, service discovery. We had two options. Option one uh, was we could have used an Amazon internal uh, ELB. It's basically a load balancer that's only visible inside of your network. It's not visible on the outside. And something called Route 53 private hosted zones, which 
Also, it's DNS, except it's not visible to the entire internet. It's only visible um, inside of your Amazon account. So uh, the, the problems that we had were that I didn't want to start uh, Amazon to have, have them bill us for every single load balancer, for every single customer, and every single... No way. I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay with Amazon. I'm not that okay with Amazon. And I also didn't know about these private hosted zones at the time, so I was kind of screwed. So uh, what that would have looked like had, had we done is we'd have this well-known uh, IP address, uh, sorry, host name. Okay, the host name would be hosted in Route 53, which would point to some load balancer. The load balancer would balance between these guys. Uh, if uh, any of these workers failed a health check, it would be taken out, and the load balancer would take care of everything for us. So option two was to go with the standalone uh, service discovery. And there was Zookeeper and there was Console, and uh, those were the two uh, big ones that we were looking at. We chose Console. Um, so a bit about Console. Console has a lot of great features. Uh, service discovery, KV storage, uh, global mutexes, semaphores, the leader election. Uh, it's highly available, active, active, kind of active, active, sort of active, active. Encryption, both the gossip and the, the RPC protocols can be fully encrypted. Uh, it's got health checks built in. Uh, it's really elastic. It, it fits the cloud really well, uh, in my point of view. And this is what, what, so what information would a publish app microservice that we took uh, typically do with console? So first thing is registration. Would, it, uh, when it would register itself, it would register both the node, the, the, the physical uh, compute instance that's running, and the service that's running on it. Uh, we, it would want to ask, OK, well, where, where are my parse app and my uh, sign app? I need to work with those. Where are they? Uh, and console can help it find instances for that uh, via service discovery. So earlier we said that this, this publish app is going to be storing data in S3. Uh, so what's the name of the bucket? Where in the bucket am I storing that? So we could store all that configuration data in the console KV storage. Um, the S3 access, since we're already inside Amazon, the proper way to do it uh, is usually to use something called IAM roles, which is Amazon basically gives you a temporary key and rotates the key for you. So that's what we did. Uh, and the last thing, the last thing that I moved my head out of the way, is the database, the, the user and the password uh, it has to know how to connect, and the host name, how do I connect to the database? So the host, since we're using a managed service of the database, we can't actually put a console agent on that. Uh, so we need to have the host uh, available in some other way. And luckily for us, uh, Amazon takes care of the load balancing and the, the published DNS and all that uh, to keep the, the RDS highly available and easily discoverable. So what does the workflow look like when we're, when we're booting up an instance like this using console? So the first thing that's going to happen, uh, what I didn't put is we're going to get the IP from, the, from Amazon. Then we're going to, the server is going to come up via our configuration management system. We use Chef. Uh, the server is going to join the console cluster. The server is going to fetch the application configuration uh, based on well-known locations in the KV uh, storage. And it might do that with something like env console or console template or, some, or it might do it internally. It doesn't really matter yet. Uh, it's going to fetch the application bits from somewhere, and it's going to boot. And then it's going to register itself with console and saying, hey, I'm alive, I'm up. OK, so instead of having uh, instead of an ELB with this well-known host name, we can now use service, dis uh, service discovery. All we need to know is the service name that we want to talk to, and console is going to uh, give us some machine inside the service group. So how does a service discovery request for the published microservice happen? Uh, with console. So console, we're going to look up this address. We're going to look for something called publish.service.customera.isappcloud.console. Uh, console is going to randomly pick a healthy uh, instance, and it's going to give us the address. If any of these fails, then console will just not serve that address uh, anymore. Uh, if we have leader follower kind of thing, so we can use tags to tag individual instances or groups of instances in, in console. So we might want to do something like master.publish.service.whatever.console. And console will only give us a healthy instance that also has the tag master. This is what it looks like inside of console's uh, UI. I didn't actually show our console UI. This is just the, the demo UI that's uh, freely available uh, off the console website. Um, so we have here 
uh, a Redis service, and there are three nodes in the service. Each one has four health checks, and it's living in the NYC data center. So we could look this up either specifically with the data center by saying redis.service.nyc3.consul or redis.server.consul, which will get the Redis service in the data center that I happen to, look like, uh, to live in. So console is really cool. Um, what can we do with it? So architectural concepts, I'm not going to go into this because I don't know that I'm going to have time, and Seth did it already. We'll go with how we want to use it. So I have a dog and a cat. <laughs> so we already split everything into VPCs. So the, the logical thing for us to do is just say that, well, uh, a VPC is equal to a console data center. And now each customer uh, gets their automatically, automatically gets their own private service registry and private configuration key value data store. Shared services live in their own sh special shared data center. They also get their own private uh, data store and their own private service recovery. So we are happy. Here's the cat. We're all happy. Uh, it's possible to perform cross data center queries, uh, and that's controllable via an ACL system. So, how do cross data center queries work? So, if this was a local uh, query, if we say that uh, publish. Is in, is in blue console, and publish says, I want to find sign app in my local console. So publish app, publish app is going to ask console blue, who is sign app. Sign app, uh, console is going to look in for the, the gossiped addresses that it has that happen to be running sign app, and it'll give it an address. Life is nice and dandy. What about in the other data center? What if I want to ask about parse app? So what's going to happen is the same thing. Publish app is going to talk to its local console. It's going to ask console blue. Who is Parsap in console green? Uh, so console blue is going to use the, the WAN pool, the WAN gossip pool, to find an address of a server who happens to, to be a server for console green and say, OK, uh, I have this question from someone in my data center saying, who is Parsap green? Uh, and console green will answer with an address for uh, Parsap. And that's going to happen over the WAN, uh, either with HTTP or HTTPS if you set up encryption. So is that good enough? It's probably good enough. Unfortunately, I had two major uh, setbacks. The first setback is that I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And the second setback was that there was another tool that I discovered when I, when I started tinkering with console, which looked really, really, really cool, and I wanted to use it. And uh, any, everyone who works with me knows that, that I, I'm usually a champion for no shiny object syndrome, and, and this time I kind of fell for it. Uh, and that other shiny object was something called Vault, also by HashiCorp. Yay, HashiCorp. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so uh, Vault gives us secure storage and audit control for our private data, and it tries to do that by uh, using one-time short-lived and audited passwords. There's a growing ecosystem of backends that uh, that'll give these that'll support these one-time audited passwords. So we have AWS STS, uh, we have MySQL, we have PostgreSQL, we have SSH. You could actually configure uh, set things up so that when you want to SSH into a machine, you go to Vault and say Vault, let me into this machine, and it'll generate a one-time password and user uh, so that your usage on that machine can then be tied to an audit uh, an audit log. Uh, there's an internal PKI, so you can tell uh, Vault to help manage uh, a PKI for you. People who are using like Docker Swarm and other things that need their own PKI, this is great. It's really easy to help manage it. Uh, and console. So remember, console has ACLs, so we can actually use Vault to get a console token, uh, with, which is a one-time password, so we know exactly who is asking for which data uh, or writing which data uh, to Vault. Uh, so we have this. I have this slide of this high-level architecture. This is also a long one. I'm not. I'm not going to go into this. This is like a 20-minute presentation that someone else should be doing. Um, but if people are curious, there's an. I don't know if you could see the address. It's kind of gray on white. Uh, but this is available on the Vault website. For people want to learn a bit more about it. So if earlier we had this, uh, we, we asked how does the Publish app utilize console, so how does the Publish app now utilize console and Vault? So the first thing that happens when it comes up, uh, we're going to get uh, a token to console and another token to Vault uh, through something that we call the provisioning system, which I'll get to really soon. The next thing, we have this already, the addresses of the well-known apps that it needs to talk to, that's still going to happen through console. We have the address of the bucket 
and the uh, and the path inside the bucket that's also still console. However, instead of IAM, we could be using Vault on every time to actually generate a one-time password, uh, one-time API key for Amazon and be using those, and then it'll be audited. The database host name is still stored in console, but the username and password, we now are using a one-time generated password, which Vault is giving us. Uh, and what it looks like when it's booting, so th the order here is slightly different. We still come up with Chef. The first thing we do is we talk to that provisioning service that I haven't forgotten to, to my promise to talk about. Uh, and it gets a console SSL key pair so that it could start joining the encrypted uh, cluster and a console access token and a Vault access token for further requests to Vault. The server can now join an encrypted console cluster instead of a plain text uh, console cluster. The server is now gonna fetch the application and boot before it does the configuration because the, the service is gonna fetch the configuration. Since we're using Vault and we want these one-time passwords, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna fetch the configuration from inside the application. So whenever a password needs to change or, or whatnot, Vault's gonna take care of that for us behind the scenes. Uh, and then the service will register with uh, Vault and the health check. So the service, uh, the, um, the provisioning service. The challenge of building such a thing is keep it safe, keep it secret. Uh, how do you bootstrap access for single image running in multiple instances or in AWS speak, uh, let's say you have a single AMI that's in an auto scaling group, how do we bootstrap that kind of access? And there are several premises that we want to stay here. Premise one, we want to audit each machine's access individually so there's no shared authentication. Uh, on the same note, every no, we don't want to allow multiple anythings to share authentication. I mean, if we're auditing things, then we want things to be auditable. So no using the same token twice. No storing secrets in a non-secret place. So what's a non-secret place? Git, chef, data bags. Anything that an ops person can look at in plain text is not secret. Because if an ops person could look at it, so can someone nasty who's getting into your network. So there have been many suggestions on, in the Vault development community for actually making an uh, authentication plugin for Vault that'll deal with it. I didn't see any that, I have not yet found any that I really like. My premise is that we should let Vault focus on what it's doing best and write our own application layer around that to, to suit our needs. Um, so the, provis the, the provisioning service, how does it work? The backbone of the provisioning service is something called the EC2 instance identity document. It's part of the metadata that, you, that all EC2 instances inside of Amazon gets, but with a twist. It includes an embedded cryptographic signature which authenticates the document, which is signed by AWS. That means no one can tamper with it. Uh, so what's inside this document? Well, we have the AWS account number, we have the instance ID, uh, so we can identify the instance. We have the primary private IP address. Uh, we have the AMI and kernel ID, so we know what this instance is running and we can you know, make sure that it's running something we want it to be running. And the launch request time, you know, if, we, if we have an instance that boots up and someone comes to the provisioning service an hour later with that identity document, something's fishy. So we're missing two things. We're missing a component role. Uh, who is this component that's running? Uh, we could tightly couple that to the AMI, but then we'd run into another problem. You'd have to have some sort of registry that, that has every single AMI that you're, that you're building out uh, and coupling that to the role that it needs to play. And, and then someone could just hack into that, build their own AMI, um, hack into that and run whatever the heck they want. No, I didn't really want to go there. Uh, also missing is the, the identity. Who is the customer that I'm running for? Um, so there was an idea that I could partition this based on AWS accounts. I could, AWS accounts are really cheap if you're a big organization. You could just have one billion account and as many little accounts as you want. Uh, and that would be a great way to partition things because we have the AWS account number in the signed document. I didn't really see an advantage to this because if someone breaches my AWS account, I'm in trouble no matter what. Uh, so we chose, we were already using, Chef was already using the, uh, some user data, some runtime user data that could be uh, set at, at boot time, and it was using that to figure out who the machine was. So we figured we'd do the same thing. 
after authenticating the, the instance with identity document, we just asked the EC2 service, can you give us that extra bit of data that, 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 we, that, the, that the machine knows about so that I can know about also and figure out who he is? Uh, and we could, it's really flexible. We could harden this later if the, if the need arises. So what does it look like? Um, an, an instance boots up, it immediately just sends its instance identity document verbatim to the, to the provisioning service. The provisioning service will first and foremost, it'll verify that the, the signature is authentic. Uh, it'll verify that the IP making the request, this is going to be a REST API, the IP making the request is the IP that's found uh, in, the, uh, in the document. Uh, it's going to verify that the AWS account ID and the, the AMI inside the, the document are whitelisted. Um, using the metadata, the metadata that it has, it's going to take the instance ID and ask the EC2 API, who is this? And it's going to get the user uh, information, the, the environment and customer information. And using that, it's going to generate uh, credentials for Vault for getting accessing whatever secrets it needs, like the database uh, username and password, and for console, uh, for whatever console needs to, to get. Uh, and it's also going to send some extra additional information to a different Vault to help uh, bootstrap the, the console, uh, encrypted console. So Amazon claims that their EC2 uh, identifiers are globally unique across everyone's accounts and across all time. It'll never be recycled. So we, we have a good way of knowing that this is also one time. We can, uh, once, we, once an instance ID has been consumed, we will never issue another token for that. Instances are guaranteed to be coming from inside our AWS accounts and from verified IP addresses. Uh, so the, the last bit of information, what's that extra console bootstrap stuff that it needs? Um, so this is some examples of uh, what we can do with Vault. So there are several pieces of information that we want to bootstrap an encrypted console cluster. The first thing is we need a, a X509 key pair uh, for use with SSL. Uh, so we get that from the PKI backend. Um, There's a little GitHub uh, link here. So normally we would use something like env console or, or console template uh, to, to get informa to query information from Vault. It works really well. Uh, the, the PKI interface is, works a little bit differently, different enough that someone who actually happens to be sitting in the audience here when I asked for that support said, no, build your own thing. So I built my own thing. Here it is. Uh, the gossip shared key. So uh, aside from the HTTP encryption, Console uh, uses a uh, symmetric shared key to encrypt the gossip protocol. So the, the current shared key uh, can be gotten from a secret backend in Vault. That secret backend is just encrypted, you know, encrypt, uh, put, put a, put, put a uh, plain text in, it encrypts it, saves its storage, and when you ask for it later, it'll decrypt it. So there's no one time happening here. Uh, the, tocal, the token for console is coming from the console backend, and the token for vault uh, is coming from no backend because there is no built-in vault backend for vault, uh, which is not an unsolvable problem because our provisioning service manages to take care of this one itty-bitty detail. So future plans and challenges, we're, we're, we're winding up to the end. Don't worry, the coffee break is almost here. Um, We'd like to have separate the vault, uh, cluster, the vault cluster so we could have one vault cluster uh, per environment or per console data center. There are a few challenges with this. Uh, challenge number one, how do we manage unsealing with so many vault clusters? So I didn't go into the vault uh, architecture, but very briefly, vaults, vault, uh, vault stores everything encrypted. And it has a built-in key ring of encryption keys that will encrypt all the data. That key ring is also encrypted by something called the master key. The master key is a sharded key uh, which doesn't sit in Vault. This is the one piece of information that's not in Vault. It's you know, the, the, the one ring to rule them all. Uh, and those keys sit with the, the actual humans who are supposed to allow Vault to open. And that act is called unsealing. So what happens is when you bring up a Vault process, the first thing you do is that everyone who has uh, a shard, or everyone who's a, who has a required shard, you could split it up so that there's only a certain quorum needed, goes in and manually says, yes, I trust that this uh, vault server is, is OK. This is my part of the key. And when it gets enough shards, it'll unseal itself. So if we're running a production cluster of, let's say, two or three uh, vault servers for high availability, that's manageable. If we go back to, you know, way back at the beginning, we saw how many environments we have. We want to do this for every single environment, each one with a highly available cluster. Yeah, that's going to be bad. It's bad, okay. <laughs> 
We also have an open question, how do we pass the secrets from the provisioning service to the client, to the application service in a secure manner? Um, so environment variables are you know, a really popular way of doing this, especially with people using Docker, right? It's not in the process, you can't sniff it anywhere. Okay, well, who's gonna set that environment variable? How, where, where is that gonna happen? Uh, so that's an open question for us. And also, at some point, we want to move to containers. We, we know that containers are a big thing. We're currently not using containers mostly because uh, we, wanna, we want the, the security standpoint of having each compute instance in its own you know, uh, VLAN and its own firewall rules. But we want to move to containers. But if we have the provisioning service, which is currently really tightly coupled to the Amazon instance, how are we going to change that when uh, containers come around and, are ready, and we decide that we're ready to use with it? So, I don't have qu answers for those questions now, sorry. Uh, to, so to sum things up, we had the initial question that we opened with. In a modern cloud where most hardware is multi-tenant by definition, how can we accomplish single-tenant partitioning? We had divided the answer into three parts, hardware, networking, and application. Hardware, we said we do the partitioning by simply giving each, uh, each software component that belongs to any given customer its own dedicated compute instance. Networking, we, we had two parts. We're putting each customer in its own VLAN or VPC in Amazon speak, and we also have firewall rules or security groups per component environment uh, compute instance. And on the application layer, we separate uh, the shared and, uh, and private microservices uh, via console data centers, and we use console vault in the provisioning service to provide partitioned zero configuration. That's all, folks. <laughs>